Hey everyone, Rarity Dash here, and it's time for another reaction request. If you have a video that you'd like me to react to, check the description below. There's a link that'll take you to a Google document with all the relevant information. And uh, today we're back with Flandreau for another video comparing the versions of uh, Harry Potter games. Uh, yeah, this time it's uh, the second Harry Potter book and movie, uh, which is Chamber of Secrets. And uh, it's got games for the PC, PS1, PS2, Xbox, uh, NGC, Nintendo GameCube, uh, Game Boy Advance, and uh, um, what is CGB? Oh, game, is, is, there's a Game Boy Color here, so I guess it's going to be GBC, though? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> anyway... I'm definitely surprised there's still a Game Boy Color version by the time, uh, this is, is Chamber of Secrets, it's like a year or two later, right? So, uh, I'm guessing it's going to be very similar to the, the, <laughs> the, uh, first movie's Game Boy Color game, because they already had the assets for that and everything. Anyway, uh, let's go and get into this. Uh, as I said in the first video, I, I don't really know any of the Harry Potter games. I love the series, the books, and the movies, but I never really got into the games or much of the merch overall. Um, but uh, yeah, eager to learn about what games did exist back then. Here we go. Did you know there were five different versions of the Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets nope. game? And I don't mean the same game on five different platforms. No, I'm talking about five completely different games made yeah, by get different the RPG modes. back. And in this video, we're going to compare each of them. But first, we need to go back. In 2001, the world's biggest book gets adapted into a movie by Warner Brothers. This is followed by a slew of merchandise, including video mm -hmm. games. WB would go all out, releasing four different Harry Potter games that year. PlayStation 1, PC, Game Boy Advance, and Game Boy Color. I did a video comparing those games and the sixth generation version released in 2003, which you can view here. The following year saw a release of the sequel, Chamber of Secrets, and WB would release tie-in games on all the same platforms as before, plus PlayStation 2, GameCube, and Xbox, the latter two consoles having been released worldwide in spring of that year. The main reason I'm giving you this breakdown is because I'm going to be doing quite a lot of comparison between the Philosopher's Stone games and the Chamber of Secret games. Oh, so good thing I've wide, seen that video first. With that being said, let's I'm start guessing they're very similar. look at the Elder Statesman of the bunch, PlayStation 1. The PS1 version of the Philosopher's Stone shared flagship status with the PC version. Both games were different, but equally beloved by the fans. So how does the sequel stack up? Well, we get the same book opening as the first game. Harry is rescued by Ron and the twins and taken to the burrow where the game begins. And you can tell straight away this game recycles a huge portion from the first game. Not That's just the does. character models, but entire animations. The burrow is used to reintroduce the player to the control and spells learned in the last game. Plus, it throws a couple of new mini-games your way, like Gnome Tossing. And this one, where the ghoul in the loft chucks pipes all over the place which you have to catch before they make a noise that will piss off Mrs. Weasley. Wait, what? Okay. Wouldn't it be easier yeah, to just kill him? <laughs> <laughs> that's right, Harry. Keep going. Hey, look! Ginny's over by the Puffs game patch. I don't quite understand. Why does Ginny look like a 40-year-old drug addict from Glasgow? <laughs> wow. I'll fucking love you if you don't All right then. So with the burrow section finished, yeah, these models could use some work. Via the flu network. What the fuck is going on? One second, I'm fighting washing machines in the back garden. Yeah, not how I pictured the flu network. Level. So this version of Chamber of Secrets skips the entire Diagon Alley sequence and cuts straight to the Ford Anglia train chase. Oh jeez, I still have PTSD from playing this level as a child. You'd get so close to the end and then BAM! The train would just oh. ram you out of nowhere. The car then crashes into the Whomping Willow, which Harry defeats by flippendoing it right in the mouth. And then we're back to good old Hogwarts. And I mean that literally old Hogwarts because most of this castle is recycled from the last. Of course. Game. Same nearly headless nicks, same sound effects, even the bloody baron just moving around in the background just like the first game. And of course, the same nightmare fuel faces on some of the Hogwarts children. Ugh. Okay, to be fair, the developers did add some extra rooms and corridors inside the castle, and the outside has also been reworked. Ugh, this game could really do with like a mini map and maybe some decent camera controls. The camera movement is still mapped onto 
onto the shoulder buttons in this game. I guess they were thinking about those two children who still had a non-DualShock PlayStation oh. 1 controller. I realized replaying this game that there are really only about two or three models for NPC students in this game, and they just keep swapping their hair color. A big chunk of the game still consists of Harry learning spells from teachers, and the Simon Says mini game to learn these spells has also been carried over. Oh dear. Oh dear. Not good. Not good. Oh, and it looks like Ron is challenging us to a friendly duel. Only he's not very good. Ow! <laughs> well, that's Ron, so. Ow! Malfoy then arrives and calls Hermione the wizard N word. Ron tries to curse him but ends up backfiring and making himself vomit slugs. So far, mm -hmm. it's all pretty faithful to the source material, but this is where the game goes off the rails. You have to chase Ron around the Hogwarts ground while he vomits, and the floor is also slippery. But that's not it. This section is followed okay. by a mini game where you have to collect Ron's vomit. Uh, wonderful. But hey, at least everyone's favorite character from the first game makes a return. That's right, I'm talking about PS1 Hagrid. But in this game, he's not wearing a coat, and he's also much lazier, making children do his groundskeeper duties for him. Let's see if you can get these blasted gnomes out of my pumpkin patch. Wasn't that fun, Harry? Do you want to play again? No! Quidditch returns, and the broom controls are every bit as bad as they were in the last game. Look at this, for some reason Wood's mouth keeps moving after he's done talking. Do you want to try them again? Do you live with a bed hog and sleep goblin? Good snooze, you're gonna sleep. Now that's some nightmare fuel. Thankfully, yeah. unlike in the first game, you don't actually have to play Quidditch matches this time around. The only Quidditch section you do have to play is this part from the movie where Harry and Malfoy chase the snitch under the stadium. Also, what's the deal with this catch mechanic? Instead of grabbing the snitch, Harry's hand just does this weird forget about it motion. This is followed by a section where Harry goes to Diagon Alley to get the ingredients for the Polyjuice potion. Wait, I hear you say, Harry never did that in the movie or the yeah. book, and you'd be right, he didn't. This level is entirely recycled from the first game. Remember having to go from shop to shop to get ingredients? Yep, it's pretty much the same here, only this time with a Christmas palette swap. I think even the devs realize this, so they threw in this joke. It doesn't look very Christmassy in here, does it? Is this better? How can I help you? I mean, look, they even recycled this Hagrid scene. With all the ingredients collected, the trio brew the Polyjuice Potion and drink it. And you now get to play as Crab, or is it Goyle? I, I could never tell the difference. I, and yeah. you never guess what happens next? That's right, <laughs> another do. chase. How in God's name does this part of the story turn into a chase? Well, apparently, Harry doesn't know where the Slytherin common room is, so he has to chase a random Slytherin around the castle. Oh, and the floor's slippery again. Why? Well, because this is just the reskinned Gringotts Bank section from the first game. What made these developers think, hey, remember the most annoying mechanic in the first game? Yeah, let's add more of it into the sequel. Alright, with the recon mission over, it's time to get back to the girls' bathroom and tell Hermione about the- oh, oh, oh no, no, wait, for some reason Moaning Myrtle is pissed and throwing bits of plumbing at you. Alright, what's next? Let me kill you. Huh? Professor Sprout? Is that you? Is this because I kept messing up your button? Yeah, I don't think that's All right, Professor let Sprout. Me try this. Wait, I've seen this spell before. Now run along. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day, and I have something very special planned. Oh Jesus! So the next day, Harry attends Lockhart's Valentine's party, where Lockhart hires these singing card-carrying cupids. Oh, you, Harry Potter, stay there. I've got a musical message to deliver to you. You know, at first, I thought the devs were just high when they added this part, but then I remembered this was actually a part in the book. And you never guess what happens next. That's right, another chase. And this one is a direct copy of the troll chase from the first game. And speaking of, of course, copy, I'm pretty sure these cupids have the same heads and beards as Dumbledore. All right, so then you go through the forest, fight Aragog, and get saved by Ron in the Ford Anglia. Is it time for another chase? No. Wait, hold on. So you're telling me they turned Ron throwing up into a chase, Crab and Goyle was a chase, even Lockhart's Valentine was somehow a chase. But this, the only chase 
in the movie. Yeah, that's a good that's point. That's uh... This is such a weird choice considering they already have the infrastructure from earlier on in the game. Oh well. The rest of the game follows the story Surprising. pretty closely. Lockhart, Ron and Harry go down the secret tunnel into the Chamber of Secrets. They're separated by some rocks and then Harry confronts Tom Riddle alone. The final battle is divided into two parts. First, you flip the shit out of the basilisk. Then, Fawkes drops Gryffindor's sword and Harry uses it to reflect the basilisk's beam back in its face. I don't remember a and beam. The game. Realistically, I'd say only about 40% of this game is like, actually is new. Gaze? It's probably best to think of Chamber of Secrets for the PlayStation 1 as a post-game for the Philosopher's Stone. You know, the same way that Kanto was a post-game in Pokemon Gold. I mean, I say that now, but I probably wouldn't be too happy if this was a modern game that I forked out 60 to 70 pounds for. Also, that one year made a big difference. The Philosopher's Stone game stood side by side with the PC as the flagship version, but this time around, WB realized that most kids were probably going to be buying the next-gen version. So it seems like the attitude Warner Brothers took to this game was, you know what, why the hell not? We've got the assets already, might as well put something together and sell a few copies to the poor children who can't afford next-gen consoles. And speaking of next-gen, let's take a look at Chamber of Secrets for the PlayStation 2, GameCube, and Xbox. Surely all three of these games are the same. Well, actually, not entirely. You see, okay. the Xbox and GameCube versions were developed by the British developer Eurocom, but the PlayStation 2 version was actually a port of these games done by EA UK. This resulted huh. in a few differences. The environmental lighting seemed different, and so yeah, were several different. of the cutscenes. You ready to do a bit of denoming then, Harry? Well, I'm not sure, Ron. I've been with Dursley so much this summer, I'm a little rusty. The gameplay between these versions remains identical apart from one uh, quite major feature, actually, and that's uh, free roaming. You see, the PlayStation 2 version allows Harry to free roam around the grounds of Hogwarts, while the GameCube and Xbox didn't. You were just kind of teleported from one area to another, and this also affected the flying mechanics. On PlayStation 2, Harry was able to take off and land wherever, while in the other two versions, you were only allowed to do it in specific areas like Hagrid's Hut and the Herbology Greenhouse. And hmm. for many, this made the PlayStation 2 version superior to the other two, despite being a little buggier and clunkier with the frame rate, at least in my opinion. But what about the rest of the game? It's actually pretty good. The stylized graphics look decent, especially when compared to the PlayStation 1. Yeah, wow, yeah, big improvement. a single generation can make. This game also uses the burrow as a tutorial section, just like on PlayStation 1. You fight washing machines, get reacquainted with some of the spells, and toss gnomes. <laughs> Right on target! It seems like WB gave each developer a checklist of points they had to hit, and it was really up to the devs how they did it. There's no LSD flu powder trip here, instead you go straight from the burrow to Bogan's shop, which you actually get to explore, unlike in PlayStation 1. There's no attempt to adapt the story around existing assets in this game. This version was developed from the ground up around the Chamber of Secrets, which is somewhat ironic because the following year, WB would release a version of the Philosopher's Stone for PlayStation 2, Xbox, and GameCube, which would end up reusing a ton of assets yeah. from the Chamber of Secrets. That game would end up being to this game what Chamber for PlayStation 1 was to Philosopher's Stone. Yeah, for interesting how that works hey, out. This is Electronic Arts, after all, yeah. these guys know all about making the same game over and over again. Because of this, I feel like I've already covered a big part of this game in my last video, so I'll be brief. For a lot of people, this is their favorite Harry Potter game, and I can see why. The controls and gameplay are decent. Hogwarts is a vibrant place with plenty of nooks and crannies to explore. There are plenty of fully voiced cutscenes, along with mini games, side quests, and loads of extra stuff to collect. It also has a much better Quidditch game, which would actually become the basis of the Quidditch World Cup game the following year. Similar to the PlayStation 1 version, you go around learning spells, only this time they're obtained through these Zelda-esque dungeon challenges. Actually, if you're a Zelda fan, then this is definitely the Harry Potter game for you, because it borrows a ton of mechanics from that series. And what about the end battle against the Basilisk? 
Well, you get the sword straight away this time, although it's kind of short. More like Gryffindor's switchblade. Oh wait, yeah, that really looks... why it's just a reskinned oh. world. Thankfully, you're not wow. reflecting anything in this version, but you are shooting what looks like force lightning at the basilisk's neck. And that's it, not a lot more to it, really. Harry saves Ginny and everybody pretends like nothing happened. As I said, it's a good game all around, and there's not one slippery chase to be found. What else could you ask for? Okay then, next we have the PC version. Let's give this one a spin. Okay, so we start with some nice cutscenes. Harry Potter goes back to Wait, Hogwarts. what's going on? He will be immortal. What? Why is Harry wearing fashion specs? Famous Harry yeah, Potter. I don't know. Well, that... Can't even go into a book. Don't remember that from the movie. Why are they talking over each other? Why is everything happening so quick? Okay, so surprise, surprise, this two decade old PC game doesn't exactly run properly on modern PCs. So it took a couple ah. of patches to get it running. This version relegates the entire start of the story to cutscenes. You don't see the burrow. You don't play Diagon Alley. No train chase. Straight to the Whomping Willow. And this Whomping Willow section is also completely different from the other two. You don't so much battle it as crawl under the branches and then hit it with a spell. Oh. Thanks Harry, much appreciated. With that done, we're off to Hogwarts. Hmm, you know what, I can't help but think this looks familiar. Oh wait, that's right, this version also reuses a fair bit from its predecessor. And look, to be fair, this kind of makes sense for these types of games. Harry yeah. goes back to Hogwarts every year. So why would the devs waste time completely redoing the castle? What's unfortunate is that they didn't even bother to add Diagon Alley or the Burrow to this game. Another detail I found interesting is that all three of these versions have pretty much the same voice cast, but they're doing completely different lines. Password? Uh, pig snout? Caput Draconis? Finally, there's the portrait of the fat lady. Give her the password and let's go to bed. I thought you'd have the password. I can't get into the common room, Harry. She wants the password. So what about the gameplay? Well, similar to the PlayStation 1 version, you learn spells which you then use to clear mini dungeons. Thankfully, Chamber replaces Philosopher Stone's bullshit drawing system with directional arrows. A sizable <laughs> chunk of this game also revolves around Harry collecting ingredients for the Polyjuice Potion, but this Harry is obviously much poorer than his PlayStation 1 counterpart because he's got to look for the ingredients around Hogwarts instead of just buying them in Diagon Alley. This game isn't that what he actually did though? System, but it's a bit different to the PlayStation 1. Here you have to bounce spells back at your opponent, making it feel more like wizard volleyball. This version also has what I like to call dirty Quidditch. There's none of this having to fly through rings business. Here you chase the snitch while shoving and kicking the other seeker away. Best version of Quidditch by far. And hmm. I do like the little details in this game, like finding Crab by following the trail of chicken legs he's left behind, or the satisfying little crunching noises the spiders make when you step on them. The game is mostly made out of puzzle section, but there is a fair bit of collecting you can do for things like wizard cards. This version probably has the most hidden rooms and sections compared to the others, and I always found it really funny how the Slytherins have to go through this huge, deadly obstacle course just to go to bed in their common room. <laughs> and I just want to point out that all three of these games have a great soundtrack that isn't reused from the movies. Okay, so what about the Chamber of Secrets itself in this version? Well, you've got to clear a shit ton of puzzles to get there, and then when you do, it's actually rather small. More like the double bedroom of secrets. Once again, the battle involves Harry shooting projectiles from the sword at the basilisk. Only this time it pops in and out of sewers. I think the most memorable thing about this final boss is the overly dramatic slow motion scene at the end, which culminates in the basilisk bleeding um, crude oil? And that's it for the PC version. Just like its predecessor, it's a decent puzzle adventure game. Yes, it reuses elements from the first game, but not quite as many as the PlayStation 1 version. But it's still held back a bit because it reuses last year's graphics. This is especially evident when comparing to the PS2 version. In terms of graphics, this game definitely sits somewhere between the PlayStation 1 yeah, and the PlayStation yeah, 2. You can and see so that. there we have the three mainline versions versions of the game. But what about the handhelds? Well, there were two portable versions of Chamber of Secrets. First, we have the Game Boy Advance. This game opens with some nice PowerPoint slides before starting at Diagon Alley. Surprisingly enough, this is the only version of Chamber which isn't reworked or copied from its predecessor. 
the GBA version of Philosopher's Stone. Yeah, it looks top down platform. Asymmetric. Meanwhile, this one is isometric. And yeah. right from the start, you can tell this game loves to throw unnecessary obstacles at poor Harry. You want to take some money out from Gringotts? Push a bunch of crates and dodge lava. You want to come back to the burrow? Well, you've got to find some flu powder. You want to make it up to your dormitory after a long day? Well, Peeves is blocking it and he's going to be throwing giant pots at you. I know they say conflict is the heart of drama, but come on, give this kid a break. Apart from that, this is your standard Harry Potter game. You collect beans and wizard cards, learn spells, and help fund the Weasley twins' black market business. Most of the game has you going through isometric dungeons, pushing blocks and pulling levers. Lots and lots of levers. You spend almost as much time pulling levers as you do sneaking around prefects at night, who also appear to be the only students at Hogwarts apart from Harry, Ron and Hermione. This game hmm. does feel very empty, but it is a Game Boy Advance game after all, so you can't expect too much. These isometric style platformers are always a bit difficult to play on the Game Boy's D-pad. Also, this game will have these weird trippy stages. Oh god, where the hell am I? And why is Hedwig Yeah, that's a good question. I, uh, um, the, what is I, this? Is this <laughs> hell? Did it Harry looks like it. For practicing witchcraft? There is Quidditch, which is more flying through rings, and for some reason the background looks like Harry's flying around in someone's back garden. Oh, and uh, this game also connects to the GameCube version via link cable and allows you to unlock some secret rooms. Are you ready to see Harry transform into Goyle? Bam! That's it, he just changes robes. You don't actually fight Aragog in this version, he just talks at you for a bit. Alright, I've heard enough. Taxi. I mean, that's accurate. Okay, yeah. Chamber of Secrets. The good news is, it's bigger in the than book. the PC version. The bad news is, the uh, Basilisk kind of looks like a big turd. No sword here, you just keep zapping him with spells. Okay, so what's the verdict for this version? Look, it's decent for an early Game Boy Advance game. It has a shit ton of dungeon puzzles, so if you like that, this is definitely the game for you. And so we come to the final version of Chamber of Secrets. This one is for the Game Boy Color. You heard me right. A Game Boy Color game released in 2002. Yeah, in that fact, seems very late for the it. last game released for the Game Boy Color. Ah. So what's it like? Well, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but it borrows a lot from its predecessor. But again, that's not exactly a bad thing. Just like Philosopher's Stone for Game Boy Color, it's a turn-based RPG in the style of old Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest games. And just like its predecessor, the first thing you notice is that it has some really fluid animations for a Game Boy Color game. Um, yeah, Mrs. Weasley, cool. everything in your house is trying to kill me. I find it funny that even this Game Boy Color RPG has a gnome tossing mini game. It seems to have been made compulsory by Warner Brothers. Look, we don't care about the genre. We don't care if you have bearded cubits chasing Harry, but you have to have gnome tossing. This game is incredibly faithful to the book. It doesn't skip any section. You go from Dursley's to the Burrow to Diagon Alley, back to the Burrow, and then you actually get to see the section when Harry Harry and Ron are locked out of platform nine and three quarters, and you even walk around Muggle London. And okay, it's a lot easier to make a level on a Game Boy Color game than it is on a home console, but you still have to hand it to these developers. There's even a cool little section where you chase the train in the Ford Anglia. Another improvement over the first game oh, is the you actually have to have other characters in your party apart from yeah, that's, the that's Wait, what are they fighting? A big deal. Is that the hand from Adam's family? As I said, this game does recycle a fair bit from the first one, and just like the other versions, Hogwarts is where it's most evident. The castle is still filled with these weird statues and paintings. But hey, at least it's filled with other students, unlike the Game Boy Advance version. There are also a ton of items hidden all over the place. You've got money in the rubbish bins, you've got booster cards in the urinals. I don't remember Hogwarts having a music room, though. Or a classroom of a muggle television. In addition to gnome tossing, yeah, that's a few weird. Mini games. There's Quidditch and Ghost Head Bowling, and the game is filled with nifty little sprite animations like Malfoy casting Sectum Sempra, Forks combusting on the spot, and my favorite one of Dumbledore just dragging Colin Creevy's petrified body up to the hospital wing. And this version actually made an effort of changing the player model to Goyle. Also, this game's original soundtrack has some really nice 8-bit melodies. There's something really creepy and hypnotizing about Aragog's pincers being the only things to move in this battle. Almost as creepy as Gilderoy Lockhart's perpetual grin as he tries to kill you in battle. You're going <laughs> to die now, Harry. 
So, what about the final battle? It's pretty well done. Nice oh, even Fox gets to be a party Eric member. actually gets to swing the sword in this one. And Fox the Phoenix actually joins your party as a playable character. All of that is rounded off with a cool That's little cool. sequence where Harry stabs the Basilisk through the brain. All in all, this is definitely the best of the two handheld versions. And, as long as you don't mind a ton of turn-based battles, it's probably one of the better versions of the game overall. It's yeah, it looks the like the one that I would play. Narrative Wise, every scene I can think of from the movie and even the book makes it into the game. Hell, they even added that nice little bit where Forks flies all of them out of the Chamber of Secrets at the end. Not only is this a decent Harry Potter game, it's also a pretty decent farewell game for the Game Boy Color. And so, there we have it. All That's five really cool. versions of the Chamber of Secrets. If I had to rank them, I'd say the PlayStation 2 is probably the best overall, but the PC and PlayStation 1 both have their moments, even if they do borrow a lot from their predecessors. PC is a lot more puzzle heavy while the PlayStation 1 is action oriented. And by action I mean chases. Lots and lots of slippery chases. But hmm. the uh, Game Boy Color version is also worth a mention. It's a surprising dark horse in this collection. And I can't think of any other time where there were so many versions of the same game released simultaneously. All across different genres, from action to puzzle to Zelda-esque to RPG to Slippery Floor Simulator. I'd be really interested to hear from you guys in the comments. Let me know which version is your favorite, how many of these games you played, the memories you have playing them. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Okay, well there we go. I wonder if the, it got more standardized after this. Uh, I, don't know, I guess we still got an 18 minute video for Prisoner of Azkaban. So eventually, though, you gotta imagine that it just gets completely standardized. But no, even for. Maybe not. Even 18 minutes for Order of Phoenix. So. Maybe. Maybe they were making multiple games for a while with this series. <laughs> maybe the whole way through. Um, but uh, yeah, that was very interesting. Very interesting. Um, yeah, because, uh, again, I did not know anything about these games. Uh, I mean, it's about pretty predictable that a lot of them would be reusing assets, be very similar to their predecessor. Um, because of course that's how it's going to be. But, uh, I mean, it's still some cool stuff. And that RPG one looked actually really cool. Um, Looked like just a definite, uh, like they took the idea of the uh, Philosopher's Stone RPG and just improved uh, on every aspect of it, it looked like. Um, so yeah, cool stuff there. Uh, cool video, he presented it well. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed this. Hope you guys liked the reaction, let me know if you did, and see you in the next one.